45, 46, 47, approximately four years of work had gone on before ONR came into the program, and the transitions had already been made from the differential anal uh, to the analog differential analyzer to the uh, analog aircraft analyzer to the digital aircraft analyzer to the abandonment, really, of the aircraft analyzer idea and the conversion of the idea that whirlwind was for air traffic control. We had a contract with uh, the Air Force in that area and for a real-time online military combat information center. So that was, uh, that was launched before ONR came along. And ONR wanted to look upon all of that as science and a machine for mathematical analysis. So there was really a very large cultural gap. Right. Was there, excuse me. Was there uh, the transfer to ONR in part uh, a budgetary one? Uh, ONR had they had money available. Uh, no, I would say that it was uh, a matter of the Navy having formed the Office of Naval Research, just uh, proceeding on the presupposition that any digital computer is a mathematical instrument. Mm -hmm. And the professional mathematician should be actively engaged, whereas until 1947, Jay had no mathematicians of, sta of stature uh, directly associated with the project. Mm -hmm. Franklin did come in, Professor Franklin came in. But well, really, well, Franklin spent no, quite no, some time no, with no, us. Franklin, yes, right. uh -huh. he, but he really came in as a consequence of uh, Murray of Columbia mm -hmm. looking in on Whirlwind to help. Uh, LA the concerns of ONR, and he made the suggestion that Phil Franklin come aboard. And Phil was instrumental in bringing up the, the applications group, what would be the programming and <coughs> software part of Whirlwind in 1948 and beyond. But let me say a few more things about the situation in ONR and the mathematics group, especially after the war. Mena, I would say, and C.V.L. Smith, Mena, Mena Reese, C.V.L. Yeah. Smith, to a lesser extent, A.E. Smith, Albert Smith, um, um, called themselves as professional I mathematicians. I had a number of contacts with her in oh, those days, oh, yes. she was worrying. Oh, uh, yes. I know <laughs> you did. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Minna was, uh, I counted her at the time as being uh, afraid. She had these responsibilities and she did not know how to discharge them. She went to a consultant referred to in the book here, and he visited the project and came back with a scathing report, which shook her up. And she never has told anybody who it was, but I know. <laughs> well, at this stage, is it uh, all right to know? <laughs> well, I'm certain it's Tommy Tompkins, C.B. Tompkins, and, uh, because I know he was consulted for her, and I know he would have been as scathingly critical. <laughs> of critical of... Uh, of Warwick. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that gave me a, a, a real problem. And one thing led to another, and it was finally the ad hoc group formed by the Research and Development Board that was the great arbiter of the project, concerning the project, of all the other computer development projects mm -hmm. uh, going on, too. Was that in the days when Bush was chairman of... Uh, no, no, it was quite a bit later. That was 50 and 51, the on, ad hoc I think study. As a matter of fact, I have some records yes, about Compton, you, you, KT, Compton's... Uh, well, Carl, Carl Compton was head of the Research and Development Board at right. the time we wrote that 15-year uh, forecast, and it was at his request that we did it. And he had set up a, uh, a committee in uh, the Research and Development Board at that time. Uh, an ad hoc committee to survey the computer That's projects right. and mm -hmm. get back with the kind mm -hmm. of advice, come back with the kind of advice that Mena needed to uh, lay down a, a course of action, especially concerning whirlwind. But Mena was afraid, uh, and she had the presupposition that so many people had in the area of science and mathematics that the, it did require uh, mathematical talents of a high order to get on even with the engineering of these computers. Mm -hmm. And they were simply incorrect, just incorrect. Well, you see, uh, well, one, one, measure, one measure of the incorrectness was that one of the steady criticisms we had to withstand was that Whirlwind was a 16 binary digit machine and therefore useless. <laughs> well, we, uh, we felt it was 16 binary digits and we weren't so sure about the usefulness, but we felt it was a necessary step 
in getting reliable machines. Well, now most most of the personal computers these days are 16-bit and less. So uh, it turns out that even eight binary digit machines have made quite a name for themselves. <laughs> right. Well, that explains Amina Reese's concern. When she first visited, the first time I met her, I had just finished the five-digit multiplier, <laughs> which was a prototype, as you may remember, mm -hmm. with a 16-bit machine, and uh, she could not understand what it was for. And I had to go through this a dozen times. And then she wanted to know why in the world. I couldn't have done We had a look before that. We had a breadboard of one digit who was trying to survey the logic and the feasibility of building the other one. Mm -hmm. She had no, she could not understand why we didn't go right to whirlwind from that. And I said, you know, it doesn't, just barely works. It doesn't work very well. And she couldn't understand things like, uh, pulses and on lines that must be terminated and all that sort of business. That was completely foreign. And uh, so it was a difficult afternoon, I remember that. <laughs> well, I, I can't help but remember the fact that uh, the administration uh, people at the Institute were getting very word uh, about the financial problem. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, you know, feeling that uh, ONR might uh, uh, withdraw or whatnot and or would they, uh, or would be left if they if they did? Uh, so there was a one point where I think we were very close to a decision to uh, give up uh, the whirlwind project. Uh, I'm sure what would have right. happened uh, with uh, your crew. I don't know if we had made that decision, but it, it seemed to be almost uh, a necessary decision out of prudence at that time, and out of the uh, insecurity of ONR's mm -hmm. uh, support of the uh, program. Yeah, uh, speaking for my own attitudes in that period, uh, <coughs> on the level of uh, the support of whirlwind, the, uh, I was with one, I was as one with Jay and Bob and the others on the potential offered by these computers and the importance of proceeding with a kind of development effort that uh, Jay was advocating an even larger development effort. I was uh -huh. strong in, uh, in support of that all through those years, post-war years. Uh -huh. But it became increasingly evident that uh, the Special Devices Center was not going to make a go of it. Right. There was a there were there were three consecutive commanding officers of the Special Devices Center at Sands Point who were strange people. Uh -huh. <laughs> One of them was a song of the zest, zest. Uh, one, of them, one of them had almost too much zest. <laughs> yeah. I refer to Captain O'Rear. Uh, and he was strongly supportive of the project, but I can't help but feel that uh, he saw himself going from captain to admiral if he could make it go. But for a number of reasons, he did not last, and his two successors didn't either. Mm -hmm. Well, there's always a problem with strong, enthusiastic support from people who develop that enthusiasm before they really have a solid foundation That's right. for it. That's right. mm -hmm. That's true everywhere. Yeah. I have problems like that now. So in the winter of 47-48, it became entirely clear that it was only a question of time before special devices stepped out of the picture. It was still the question at that time whether the Navy would step up to the fact that this was an engineering problem and get view ships or view ord or somewhere like that to get behind it or that it would, in fact, stay in mm -hmm. O&R. Mm -hmm. That it wound up staying in O&R, which was unfortunate. And at that time, Louis gave up on Special Devices Center too, And he really gave up on O&R as well, as far as the support of computer development on the scale that Jay recommended, that I recommended. And he took his proposals right to Forrestal. And that led Forrestal to commission Vannevar Bush to form an ad hoc committee to study the military applications of computers. That was in the fall of 48. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, that was in the spring of 48. And by the fall of 48, that committee had been formed. And I left the Special Advisor Center to join that committee in this program. And it was a study of the, um, of the, of the future of computers in the military and uh, aimed at fostering support of the kind that was needed. And what effect that committee's reports and work had, nobody knows. There's never been any reasonable follow-up. But the gamble was, when Louis went to Forrestal, was that the kind of support that Jay needed would be forthcoming from some appropriate agency. 
And I'd like to think that um, when the Air Force stepped into the picture, it was in response ultimately to the kind of thing that Louis had launched in, in the middle of 48. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, what, in 40, uh, 49 at George Valley? Uh, no, that was in the run well of the, that was 50 to 50, 51 period. Well, George, uh, George uh, I have a, a chronology here. Oh. George Valley became chairman of the Air Defense Systems Engineering Committee. Uh, established uh, at the request of the Vice Chief of Staff to study air defense as a systems problem and to explore new approaches to the several outstanding deficiencies of the present system. And that was, when, that was, but that was, that was before their contact with Whirlwind. I don't recall yes, much that before. Was, that was before. Yes. But uh, <clears throat> it was George's committee as I understand it then, that came forward within the Air Force with the proposal uh, that uh, it was possible to uh, develop uh, uh, an elementary air defense system uh, utilizing uh, digital uh, techniques to uh, digital you see, Jerry, I believe, I believe the I believe the chronology of that is that Jerry Wiesner, having known something about what we were doing, called our work to Valley's attention the first time, Valley came up to see us about it, and of course we already had those reports that I mentioned having been written in mm -hmm. 48 on the use of digital computers for military command information. So uh, we had a uh, we had a background already in that kind of thing, and so he took both well, the discussion right. material and uh, then mm -hmm. folded them in to uh, what he was doing with his committee. That letter was uh, prepared by Al Hill and Wiesner, uh, according to uh, to my records. Yes. Uh, an address to uh, uh, and involved uh, Jay Stratton and Zacharias, and suggested the proposal to be made to the Air Force uh, to uh, look at the uh, possibility of uh, the whirlwind type of uh, uh, computer. Technology. Yes, now, it was that. essentially this, I believe, wasn't it, Jim, that led to Project Charles because the jump was too big. That came a little later, yes. Yeah, but but I, that the idea of being so radical, uh, uh, using computers in a way that they, um, had never, of course, been done before. The next thing, required, following, uh, following the, uh, uh, this, this letter and following the report of George Vallis' committee, it was a letter that Vandenberg uh, wrote to me in 1950, uh, asking the Institute to undertake a, a, a program, a project, uh, in uh, continental defense. Uh, that letter was dated, I have a copy of it here, December 15, 1950. Uh, very, very good. He argues the case uh, very well. I don't know who wrote the letter. But he says, the Air Defense Engineering Systems Engineering Committee uh, of your Professor George E. Valley was established at the request of the Vice Chief of the Air Force in late 49. This group undertook to study air defense as a systems problem and explore new approaches to the several existing deficiencies uh, of uh, what was work being worked on at that time. And then he went on at the end to say, <clears throat> my purpose is to bespeak your help. The air defense problem which faces the Air Force is of great importance. The problem is technically complicated and difficult. The Air Force must urgently increase its research and development effort in this uh, area, and in this we ask your help. Uh, and then collateral discussions that were going on, it was clear that they wanted MIT to uh, undertake a... Uh, <clears throat> a laboratory program. I must say that we were very reluctant. When I say we, Jay Stratton and myself and uh, others associated with the administration to see MIT embark upon another large military uh, program after having uh, become free of the uh, radiation laboratory <laughs> and, and other programs. So we were, we were hard to get. 
<laughs> uh, we made ourselves very hard to get uh, in, uh, in this. I don't know whether you knew how, how uh, we uh, kept arguing the case as to whether we should undertake a, a program of uh, this magnitude. But there's a very interesting sequence of letters here from uh, Vandenberg, Finletter, uh, and other characters uh, arguing the case as to why MIT should uh, undertake this. And at, in the course of this uh, pressure from the Air Force, uh, we decided to undertake a project which uh, was really, really located, as I recall, in, in the Research Laboratory of Electronics. Uh, as as a sponsoring of as a place to put it, mm -hmm. uh, there was no Lincoln Laboratory mm -hmm. at that time, uh, and we reached a point that still reluctant to undertake this uh, project, where we felt it was essential that we have outside judgments brought to bear on whether MIT ought to uh, be involved. There had been other proposals, I take it, before the Air Force. Michigan, had, Michigan uh, had one. And had one and was pressing its case. Mm. And, and we uh, went to the Air Force and said that we think we, we must organize a group of people uh, containing members, not uh, all MIT, to have a look at this. Uh, and this was the uh, origin of Project Charles. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Having known Wheeler Loomis all during the radiation laboratory days, I went to him to ask him if he would head Project Charles. And after some deliberation, he decided he would. So Project Charles, uh, a summer study program, which was patterned after uh, the uh, earlier one that Zach had run, the, the development of the summer study technique had uh, taken place, uh, and uh, there was a feeling that we ought to apply that technique to this particular problem. The first summer study that we undertook was uh, came as a result of a visit from Carol Wilson, then General Manager of the AEC, and Jim Fisk, uh, then Research Director, who came to us to ask if we would undertake uh, a study of the nuclear propelled aircraft program. Oh my! <laughs> yeah, Project Lexington, uh, and we did with Walt Whitman uh, running that uh, program. Uh, that set a pattern for a type of uh, uh, of study which enabled us to bring together people in the summertime when they were free of academic mm -hmm. duties to tackle some of these military problems. And there were a whole series of these, uh, including the one that Zach did for the Navy, which I think was a classic uh, mm -hmm. one. What was the title of that? Uh, uh, hey, don't know. Uh, what? It resulted in Haystack, but I don't know what the study no, it wasn't, was. It wasn't, it wasn't yes. Haystack. I can't. I'll get the name. Art, 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 Hartwell was suggested, is it? Uh, Project Hartwell? Art, Project Hartwell. That's right. And so... Uh, uh, this project on the wheel looms got underway. And uh, it did a number of things that were important to the national defense. Uh, for example, uh, Den Land was a member of that group. And this got him interested in uh, reconnaissance. Uh, and, and, uh, there was a lot of work done on reconnaissance in this project. Uh, but the end result was that this... Uh, this special study, this people from outside MIT in part running it, came in with a positive recommendation that MIT had a responsibility to set up a laboratory to undertake uh, an air defense system. You see, a part, a part of that was that the Air Force, at the instigation of Valley's committee, had been funding the extension of whirlwind into an experiment that's on right. air, air direction. That's what, saved, that's what saved whirlwind. Yep. Yeah. 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 When, <laughs> when Charles met, uh, we actually put on demonstrations of whirlwind automatically receiving radar data and uh, directing uh, uh, fighter planes. So there was, by that time, a limited experimental demonstration of uh, 
the ideas uh, at work. I'd be interested to know what kind of a uh, reaction it produced, those who witnessed the demonstration. Well, I think we were in a situation where <coughs> the prior existing technologies clearly weren't going to work. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> therefore, something else had to be done. And if there had been any other less radical and plausible suggestion on the uh, table, uh, it probably would have been uh, taken. But there were no alternatives. So you had a, uh, a situation where the existing ones clearly had to be abandoned. And uh, something which was... Uh, really a very radical and a very big break from all prior electronics and air defense practice. Mm -hmm. It was uh, sort of the, uh, it had gotten to the point of a very experimental feasibility and uh, it was about the only thing that could be, uh, could be uh, said yes to. Well, I, I, ran some some of those, I ran some of those experiments with right? Bob Weiser. And I'd say the, to answer your question, the reaction was quite mixed. Uh, mixed. mixed. The, right. the enthusiasm, the enthusiasts that you mentioned were there. And they could see, you know, they could see the, com <clears throat> the computer broke down about every 20 minutes. <laughs> so we have little problems occasionally. <laughs> and then when the airplanes went behind where, the clouds. Where were, where were you then? I was I was the running the whirlwind part, and Bob Weezer was running the radar part. Wow. And we were putting it together. And I remember mm -hmm. the community coming over and looking at it. And uh, once in a while, the airplanes would go behind a cloud and we'd lose them. We didn't, the radars were not all that great, you know. Mm -hmm. And they were flying somewhere over Portland, Maine. And uh, we were down here. And uh, then the computer would break down. And then, you know, we'd have to talk our way out of that. <laughs> <laughs> then we'd try it again the next day. But there were the, some people saw through all of that, and others were very skeptical. That's the only way it was very interesting. Yeah. I remember a pin letter coming up here and meeting mm -hmm. with, uh, with Stratton and, and myself. Uh, he was very vexed uh, about our reluctance and about our deliberate procedures uh, on this. Mm -hmm. But he uh, wrote a letter saying that the, uh, we should understand that there was no question whatsoever in the Air Force that this was the place where this project ought to be. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's so sorry. It was un unquestioned that uh, the Air Force was committing itself mm. uh, fully, and uh, that uh, funds were available, and as you say, uh, these were critical in uh, the future of the uh, program and uh, mm. getting it going. Uh, that, uh, incidentally, that whole summer study uh, Charles has been declassified. Oh, has it? I've got a, got a copy of it. Very good. It was a very telling uh, and uh, momentous report in many respects. Uh, so uh, we began then to develop plans for a site and for a, uh, a building complex mm -hmm. for, for the Lincoln Laboratory. Mm -hmm. I remember one little incident. Uh, uh, while we were arguing this with the Air Force and proving hard to get, uh, being in Washington and meeting Louis Ridenauer, uh and sitting on a park bench in Lafayette Park in the same <laughs> way that Baruch and Compton and Conant had on the rubber program, <laughs> and uh, arguing this <laughs> case, and uh, uh, my asking uh, Ridenauer, well, why should MIT uh, undertake this? And, get itself in trouble uh, as a result of a, a big undertaking of this sort. And he said, this will make New England an electronic center. Oh, my. Uh, <laughs> was his answer at that. <laughs> Maybe he was right. <laughs> Maybe he was right. Yeah. <laughs> this will give you Route 128. <laughs> right. Yes, yes, it did. It, it had a significant effect on, on that whole, whole development. <clears throat> so. I had another conviction, being a, uh, a prudent uh, person uh, during my, the early days of my presidency here, yeah, that we had to uh, uh, be prepared to defend ourselves in undertaking another big laboratory project for the government. 
Scotty Rustin had written an article in the New York Times taking MIT to task for what he called spending billions of dollars uh, on, a, on a, a new uh, military program. Uh, Speaking of so, past ones or the forthcoming one, what was he? What was he the, addressing? The, the, the whole the building of the uh, of the major program. Mm -hmm. You mean of Lincoln Library? And we, yes. Uh -huh. uh, oh yes, the Lincoln Library. Not not the radiation. He wasn't criticizing no, the radiation no, no, lab. No, no. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, we would, we determined that we would have a documentary record of all that happened. And there was a sequence of letters here with Ben Litter and Vandenberg and others uh, in which uh, we were getting them to argue the case of why we should do this mm -hmm. and provide them. And uh, sure enough, uh, several years later, uh, the Military Affairs Committee of Congress sent up uh, uh, <coughs> some staff members to examine the records of IMIT uh, had been uh, given this uh, project from the Lincoln Library. Oh, very interesting. And uh, we got these letters uh, unclassified and turned them over to them, and we never heard anything more about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is. <laughs> I want to mention that one of the <coughs> most fascinating um, <coughs> series of events in the whole whirlwind struggle for me was the ad hoc committee of the Committee of <clears throat> Physical Sciences of the RDB, the one that was formed in the summer of 50, with Lyman Fink as its head, mm -hmm. and Trichel and, uh, and uh, Nyquist as members. He's coming on the speaker. So they turned out a tentative, uh, well, a preliminary report, uh, I think it was early 51, where they knocked the Defense Department unmercifully for its overall handling of all the projects. <laughs> they knocked most of the projects individually, and they knocked Whirlwind very hard. And uh, their principal criticism was that it had no well-defined purpose. Yes. Well, that, that was uh, one of the uh, <laughs> when was principal that? That was about arguments about OMR, that they were supporting something here. Had no apparent use. That's right. Yeah. No apparent use. And the report uh, came in for quite a bit of criticism. So the three members, the committee, the ad hoc committee had been disbanded, but the three members were brought back in as consultants. And they did revise the report. And it just by coincidence, the revision was yeah. accomplished right after the commitment from the Air Force. So they did have to acknowledge in the revised report that it did now have a, a use. <laughs> well, you know, uh, if you look at some of the indicators of that time, I believe it's reported uh, correctly. I've always understood that Howard Aiken made the statement that if all four digital computers then under discussion should by any chance work, <laughs> it, would, it would more than saturate all foreseeable needs for such machines. <laughs> now, here, yes, here's a pioneer in the field making such a statement, and it's understandable in view of what he wanted to use machines for. He was using them to create tables of functions, which you would then use to look up the numbers that you wanted. It was probably not more than four years from that when uh, computers computed every function when it wanted it and threw the result away and uh, no one ever had tables anymore. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then when you come to something like the... Uh, he was supported by uh, uh, IBM, wasn't he? Uh, well, the... Uh, the Mark I. The started. Navy, IBM, uh, IBM built Mark I. Uh -huh. And uh, the Navy was involved in uh, using it. But, of course, you... <clears throat> you go to the matter of the uh, magnetic core memory, and our friends at uh, Research Corporation made the statement at one stage that there was no foreseeable future commercial use for uh, <laughs> uh, That's another for machine story, memory. I guess we'll and, uh, <laughs> but the, the temper of the times, you see, was yeah. really to not see the uh, the possibilities or uh, the uses and uh, our. Our reviewing committees that's, that's tended to fall into that pattern. The I mean, our experience for a young whippersnapper like me, who <coughs> was sort of acting as KT's uh, surrogate here at the Institute, 
uh, in the administrative uh, uh, aspects of the whole operation. But uh, it was a learning process. Mm. It was very valuable. You, uh, you mentioned <clears throat> uh, Nat Sage um, early in your comments, and this ought to be uh, this ought to be underscored. Uh, the, the impact on the early stages of my own career, the Server Mechanisms Laboratory, and the uh, transition into the computer lab. Nat uh, Sage, in my opinion, was a very remarkable person. He was a civil engineer. I think he was an MIT graduate, was he? Yes, yes. Yes. Um, he had grown up in army camps around the world. I think his father was an army officer. And he had developed a sense of people who he trusted, who he believed, uh, and a great self-confidence in that. And there were people in MIT that he trusted. Gordon Brown shared that. I think I did. Stark Draper did. There are others that he did not trust. Uh, but uh, he, uh, uh, he was tremendously helpful in supporting those that he uh, supported and fending off uh, annoyances from uh, contracting officers and uh, uh, and various people, and uh, you could count on him for a lot of wisdom. And uh, he was a tough help. negotiator. Tough you, negotiator. Uh, we are uh, during the war were involved in uh, formulating a contractual philosophy and procedure for mm -hmm. radiation laboratory. And and so on, and develop concepts of OAN and so on, uh, that later on became the pattern for the, the whole country. Mm -hmm. And that was the uh, center, of, uh, center of this. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he wouldn't uh, yield when he had a principle in mind. And I remember one case of where they, I don't know whether it was a naval officer or uh, an Air Force officer said, Hell, what we are negotiating is not a contract, but a treaty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe, I believe there was one time in the, uh, I think there was one time in the whirlwind program where he was dissatisfied with the proposed boilerplate in the contract and spent MIT money to support us for something like eight months while he sort of dared them to cancel it until they caved in on the contract. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that was eight months. <laughs> no. well, he was a great, great person. And his close relationship with Louis and Flores was a major, major That factor. would be a big help. Oh, yeah. getting, keeping us, getting us started and keeping it going. And uh, De Flores uh, was a uh, <clears throat> remarkable character himself. See, as, a, as a completely... He had a lot to do with ONR in the background. The formation of ONR, that's, that's really, right. As a uh, complete aside from this discussion, De Flores was apparently the only person who has ever had some kind of right, I don't know where he got it, to land a seaplane on the basin out here in front of MIT. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he would come to Alumni Day flying his own seaplane, and the Metropolitan District Commission would clear the, uh, the river so that he could land. Yeah, he did that. He did that several times. And, and then it seems to me that he usually didn't wait for the completion of the speeches, so he would rev up that seaplane and take <laughs> off right at the end of the program. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he was a very, very colorful character. And, uh, you know, there was a lady who ran uh, a library in Walker Memorial. Uh, so the uh, Walker Memorial uh, <coughs> Reading Library, which we had at that time. She was a uh, jewel of a, a woman. And Louis met one of her daughters and married her. Is that right? That's right. And uh, that was good. another relationship that he had, had with the instance. Well, he gave some good advice that's transferable to other circumstances. There was uh, one stage where we uh, needed another $200,000 on the project, and I was discussing this with him, and he said, impossible. He said, it's too much for me to approve on my own authority, and it's not enough to go to the Secretary of the, Tra uh, of the Navy for you. You've either got to reduce it to 25 or raise it to a million. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Jay, there, 
we've been talking about people who had a kind of uh, confidence, uh, Sage and Flores, and above all yourself. And Gordon, and, and Gordon Brown, of and course. Gordon Brown, yeah. And before, you made an interesting remark that I was, I'm afraid was getting lost, and uh, we went off on another tangent. Uh, you talked about the general assumption that computers had a very limited use. You, talked, you quoted Aiken. Uh, you said uh, uh, the, the kinds of uses that people could imagine for computers would, would have gotten absorbed very quickly. But you obviously had a very different uh, perception, and I'm, I'd like to explore where that came from. And I'd like to uh, quote a rather remarkable thing you wrote in July 1948. Uh, there's a brief statement in this paper on uh, whirlwind and high-speed computers, which you say, digital computers show promise of almost revolutionary contributions to many branches of science and engineering, as well as to the social sciences and large-scale accounting. Now, you are obviously seized of a very different picture of the use of computers from that of a lot of your colleagues. And I'd like, like to explore what, what gave you this idea. What, why did you think uh, computers would be used by, in the social sciences and in business and in, in these other areas besides mathematics? I probably don't have a clear, specific recollection of how this came about, but uh, it was, you know, clear that computation was going on in those areas. Uh, there was, I think by that time, talk among some people of using the emerging computers for business accounting. I think that was a discussed subject oh, in 48. Sure. Uh, it's, I think, just that you have a, when you have a totally new field developing, there is a rather small inside group who discuss it, think about it, exchange views, and extend one another's vision. And of course, we had been trying to push that vision. Think about what it uh, might be. And you have a uh, very large number of I mean, most of the other people, which are simply not in touch with those discussions, and when they encounter them, consider them crackpot ideas because they simply are outside the re realm of what they're accustomed to working with at that particular point in time. But Aiken, of course, was, a, was not an outsider. He, well, he was an outsider to the high-speed electronic machine for... Uh, handling a flow of information in real time. He was very much outside of that. He, he, was a, he was a computer of the school of the people who had made log tables and navigation tables. The publication of the uh, computer industry at that time was Mathematical Tables and Other Aids to Computation. Yes. <laughs> he wouldn't even take part. Remember that conference you and I ran in New York in 51? Yes. He wouldn't even participate in that. Conference he thought it was one. ridiculous. First National Computer Conference. <laughs> I was chairman one year, and Perry was chairman the next year. Well, uh, I was just chairman of exhibits. Well, <laughs> well it, was a, it wasn't a very big group. You did everything else. I think it <laughs> was pretty much a lone wolf. Uh, but he didn't even participate. I remember I invited him to, and he didn't. He, <clears> he thought the whole thing was somewhat a, arrogant attitude toward He did. Well, he was a, he was a very a very interesting. Uh, person. He had a short temper for people of uh, uh, lesser minds. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, he had <laughs> uh, very, very short patience with people that he uh, thought were wasting his time. Oh, that's, that's good. <clears throat> and uh, yet, he was an absolutely remarkable speaker. Yes, he was. I mean, I've seen him, uh, you know, come to a meeting with his slides for his talk. Projector not there, so with a few scathing comments about the administration of the program, he throws away <laughs> slides and says, well, I'll talk on some other subject, and then deliver one that uh, seems to be letter perfect. And <laughs> <laughs> I can uh, supplement Jay's remarks a little bit about Aiken. Um, I first got on his trail in 1930, well, but roughly 1940. Uh, going through the science abstracts, I found a reference to a paper, The Calculo Mechanique, Luffy, Louis Cuffinal, the distinguished Frenchman who's been heavily into computers, and um, went on up to the Harvard Library, Harvard University Library, Observatory Library, to look at it. But it was checked out to somebody named Howard Aiken. 
Cruft Hall. So I went over to Cruft Hall to try to track him down, didn't succeed. Went back to see Sam Caldwell and say, <clears throat> asked what Howard was about. Howard, and uh, Sam uh, indicated that he was engaged in a computer project that not much was likely to come of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was sensitized to Aiken at that time. And then uh, he was in the he joined the navy. He was a naval officer. But when the Mark One was delivered to Harvard, he came back from the navy. Uh, no, still as a navy officer with Dick Block and Bob Campbell and uh, and Grace Hopper. And they were the original nucleus working with the Mark One. Grace Hopper now has the record. Now that Rick Hopper has retired, is the oldest active navy officer. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, right after the war, when the computers came on the scene in a big way, Aiken, of course, uh, had students taking a, <coughs> taking, entering his program. And uh, one of the attractions was an evening offering where he explained modern computer developments. And apropos of your remarks about his speaking ability, he was a very dramatic speaker. And I'll never forget one time when he was, uh, in effect, saying that computing mathematical tables was uh, his life career. And he said very dramatically that my, and I won't even try to get close to it, but I'll just give you a rough approximation. Somebody asked him what his ambition was, his chief ambition, and he looked the man square in the eye, kind of stooped, put his hands on the table and said, my ambition is to live to see the day of the publication of volume 20 of the Annals of the Harvard Computation Laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> and he, at, I think it was the same meeting where he said this, concerning the speed of addition and multiplication of the Mark I, and uh, uh, he, he was pointing out that if your task was to uh, produce mathematical tables, the electronic computing really didn't speed it up very much because of the time required for the publication process and the rest of it. I leaned over the table again when he was, he was characterizing the Mark I, and he said, And as my distinguished colleague from down the river is giving to putting it, the ad time of the Mark I is two million microseconds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask a question about that. Uh, to what extent did Warren Weaver play uh, some role with ONR? Oh, well, he was a chief advisor to uh, Minute Two. That's what I, yes. what I thought. Oh, yes. I, I come across a uh, quote of his in which he obviously was uh, agreeing with her about there being no uh, known objective uh, use for the uh, Horwin computer. Did you have any contact with Weaver? Or yes, even some. Project, some. Yeah. I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I just read his book. I, I don't uh, remember, so you know, the uh, uh, the intimacy or the direct importance of his role as much as uh, some people. Of course, I believe, I'm told that he also wrote a report once proving that Stark Draper's gyros wouldn't work. So. <laughs> oh, I hadn't heard that one. Well, uh, yes, he consulted the minute, and... Uh, Called upon him to. I'd like to check that. If that would be. I. I don't know where. This is just some uh, some folklore that stays with me, and I have heard from time to time. Draper might know. That would be the place I'd to like start. To track, see that track down. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'd like to see that track down. But Miller sent uh, Warren to Sands Point to spend a day with me. I remember the day well, and uh, it went tolerably well. I thought. Uh, he found that I spoke my own language, <laughs> and in the acknowledgement of our meeting, and uh, thanking, for, thanking me for the meeting, he did say, I, I'll do my best to learn good Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> learn uh, good Crawford. Good <laughs> this is Aiken, your uh, uh, This was Aiken, your mentor? No, Warren Weaver. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, he was... No, he played a major role in molecular biology, uh, so yes, that was his great. The only direct quote I remember of him was standing on a curb once, and I don't know what led up to it, but he said, and you know, his field was statistics, I believe. He said the statistical evidence for extrasensory perception is much stronger than the evidence for uh, linking uh, cigarettes and cancer. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would like to respond to the uh, business about the uh, no perceptible 
in use for whirlwind. And this adds to the DeFlores story too, but it's just filling in a little of the background that's not contained in that book and it's really never been dealt with adequately. And uh, dealt with least adequately by Minna Reese in her <laughs> recent article in the Annals of Computer, <laughs> of computer History. It, I haven't seen that. Well, it, it should be reviewed. It is a history of the computer work in ONR. Mm -hmm. And by ONR, she means in the math branch, other than whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you have to appreciate uh, the to appreciate the environment uh, that, that Jay entered when he entered in a contract with SDC. You have to realize that SDC uh, had uh, interest in a great variety of things. Louis did, I should say. <laughs> so Special Advisor Center did too. But another big area, in addition to flight simulation, was radar simulation. And they were very strong, a radar simulator that was widely, widely used. Uh, it was one that used supersonic waves in water and worked beautifully uh, to simulate the <laughs> radar display. And uh, as Jay mentioned before, combat information center simulation was a very big thing. And what they called, they had a project at Newport working on what they call system research, by which they meant research concerning the radar display screens and their understandability, perceptibility, and communication surrounding them and the like. And there was great activity on anti-submarine warfare. And uh, the Austin Company was engaged as a major contract in building quite extensive submarine simulators. And Jay mentioned also the anti-submarine anti uh, uh, simulation that he proposed with digital. And that, was a, <clears throat> that was a major, major factor that, uh, as Jay said, you literally could not do the radar simulation beyond the individual radar. You could not do anti-submarine warfare simulation or the simulation of task force warfare with the then existing computing equipment. But it was clear that it could be done easily and advantageously, powerfully by digital computers. So all of that was in the future. It's self-evident for the people at, at Special Devices. Beginning in '46, Henry Knudsen was the engineering coordinator there. It was all new to him when I arrived in the spring of, in the fall of '45. But by the end of the beginning of the next year, he was on board. And uh, the exec, Noel Geiler, turned into Vice Admiral Geiler, uh, head of the Pacific Operations in the end of the Vietnam War. He became an enthusiast, utterly convinced. No question about it. But when even an old Geiler, who was very uh, articulate, uh, very intelligent, even when he tried to explain to some of the people in Washington what this thing was about, they simply didn't hear him. It just did not register. There was nothing in their background that gave them the experience they needed to hang these words off. <laughs> Pull these ideas together. A lot of this I mean, though, is because we didn't have any kind of scale factor to cope with the things that Jay was talking about. I was on the other end of this thing trying to build some of this stuff. <laughs> and there wasn't enough memory to even do the first two right. or three things he talked about. We knew that. But, you know, if you just let your mind go and say you don't worry about that, you're going to have some memory someday. Mm -hmm. And you realize that what you were doing was a microchasm of those things. It wasn't that hard to cross the bridge. But Jay was an uninhibited by those details. <laughs> He'd just say, oh, well, you'll make that work something, all right. And we wanted 10 times the speed. I remember Everett would come to me time after time. He said, yeah, he is Norm, just as fast and as big as we can make it. Never mind if the spec's <laughs> fast and as big as you can make it. <laughs> Let me turn back uh, a minute to Bush and his differential analyzer. At what point did he begin to sense that uh, the analog uh, approaches uh, well, not necessarily going to be the dominant one in, in the future. Well, I, I, my guess is it was about 1934-5, mm -hmm. about the time he was putting forward the proposals that turned into the rapid selector. Yeah, Work didn't actually right. begin on it until perhaps as late as 37 or even early 38. But uh, there were the uh, rapid selector proposals. Then there was the article that was published about uh, the presentation he made before the American Mathematical Society in 36, which was published late in 36. The most remarkable piece of work, entitled an Instrumental Analysis, which would throw most people off. 
but instrumental analysis. Instrumental analysis. Instrumental analysis. The word computer and, and even mm -hmm. calculator didn't seem appropriate for what he was talking about. No, so you have to bear in mind that the word computer at that stage yeah. meant a young lady at a desk with a mechanical mm -hmm. multiplying machine. Well, for those who... Mm -hmm. Welcome to Gary. <laughs> Hello, Robert. <laughs> Jay, Bob Norman, good to see you. Jim, greetings. Don't get up for God's sake. Well, welcome. Have you had lunch? Yes, yes I've had lunch. It's fire hot under these lights. So. Oh. <laughs> I've been over at the Computer Museum, Trustees meeting. Oh. Uh, well, we've gone. To, we've, you mean we've gone from. Uh, Building it to museum. Building it to put it in the box. Do you decide to go to Boston? Yes. Going to move, is it? Yes, as soon as we raise the money. <coughs> I trust you would all like to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, we get uh, letters regularly from... A million dollars from each of us, and <laughs> it would uh, solve the problem. Is that it? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so... Certainly simplify my life if you just contribute before we leave. <laughs> <laughs> I want to look up this first paper that you made. Oh, it's a great piece of work. Uh, really. So, uh, what's been going Harry, on? I forgot something important. We never introduced everybody. So now's a good time. <laughs> no. Jim, is good know how we get started on the uh, Bush thing. We'll, we'll go look, back look, can we finish the Bush thing? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Let's say, uh, I was just responding to a question put to me by Jim. When did Van Aver, when did Van and its interest shift from analog to, to digital. And uh, I suggested that uh, the, the shift might have started when he started to put together information retrieval proposals around 1934. Mm -hmm. uh, he was much concerned with the, with the problem of the of consulting the technical record. The scientific uh, the, the record. library problem and so on. The library the problem, problem right. monthly about that. So that, that uh, <clears throat> started the work that led to the rabbit selector. Excuse <clears throat> me. And then in 1936, he wrote a remarkable paper, a, a survey of computer developments over the years and a prospectus of computer possibilities that is at the same time comprehensive, incisive, and beautifully written. Very compact. I've never read that. Well, is I recommend it. it no, strongly. not trying. Uh, Instrumental Analysis of the Baltimore American Mathematical Association. No, no, American no. Mathematical Association. Yes. <laughs> That's where I got the title of my bachelor's thesis, Instrumental Analysis in Matrix Algebra. Uh, and this is 36? 36. Do you have any comments about the fact that Turing's paper and Post's paper were also in 36? 35, months? I think. The, 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 right the same period. Yeah. Whose paper? Turing. Uh, and Post's paper? And Post's paper. And they're all similar, all three of these. Yes, what about Turing and his... Uh, Um, yeah. Uh, what? Or did, your, did you finish with Bush? No, no. no. Oh, let me finish I'm with Bush, then we'll, oh, we'll oh, take I'm a sorry. break. Excuse me. Uh, and in the uh, 1936 paper, there is the first anticipation of electromechanical automatic computers that I know about. There are others, but this uh, <coughs> is a plan of development that has uh, been continuous since that time. That, that is the first. And he talked about automating the, tra mm -hmm. the, the transfer of information among punch card machines and then automating the control of the machines themselves. And then went on to say that that would be a realization in the dreams of, uh, in effect, that would be a realization of the dreams of Babbage. All electromechanical at that time, or mechanical, uh, some electrical. The uh, network analyzers, of course, have been in operation for a dozen years almost. But then in 37, he wrote the series of memoranda that set forth the very comprehensive proposals for electronic digital computing and magnetic random access storage and photographic random access storage. In 37. 37. Beginning in 37, he continued until he went to the Carnegie Foundation. Are those, are those, are those published somewhere? Or? <laughs> no, uh, they were never widely circulated. Uh, at that time, reproduction was no was uh, difficult, so there were probably very few copies made, and uh, no copy has been turned up. 
even in the litigation, all the litigation that's going on. All the spirit. I'm whole, I, I, you, you, you don't have a. You, I lost my any, copy. Any and, copy exists. I lost my copy when I moved to New York after the war. I lost a box of books and papers. But uh, I'm on, on digital computing. That's right. What do you call the rapid arithmetic machine? Thirty. Uh, Beginning in thirty-seven and continuing into well, up to the time you went to Carnegie, which was late thirty-eight, I think. Thirty-nine. Thirty-nine. So he should be credited with the, the first uh, comprehensive well, proposal. I've been looking for to, uh, I'm wanting to understand better than I mm. what records I've seen show. And Bill Radford wrote a report on his work in published in 1939, making extensive not extensive but making substantial reference to those memoranda. And he almost certainly had a copy, but uh, his copy was not filed in his effects. Harry, are you suggesting that this work just stopped, that nobody did it, or was there any follow-on from well, this? Well, uh, Bill, he, he com uh, Van commissioned Bill Radford to build electro turn electronic counters, which were in operation and had been for a long time, into an adder. And Bill uh, Radford did that, and I saw it in operation in the winter of '38. Where did Bill Rathen go? You had no access to this. He was uh, in the radiation lab, the New York Treasury Department, and he's dead now. He was director of me. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he died while he was director of me. But <coughs> was, there, was there any transition from that to the uh, work on any of the early computers? Not directly. Um, Radford's went into a some other work, and Bill Overbeck was brought in to continue what Radford started, and he worked on it on high-speed electronic computers and counters, and built the first megacycle counters. Built anywhere. Now, wasn't there a wasn't there though a transition from those three or four people into wartime cryptography and back into the engineering research association? Well, that was the rapid, <clears throat> that was the rapid selector project. Larry Steinhardt, John Howard, John Coombs. Mm -hmm. uh, I was rather close to that work because I ran the differential analyzer and uh, the, the project was originally located in the corner of the differential analyzer room. But then it went to the corner of the steam lab behind a wire fence. <laughs> and then it went to points west. Yes. For, the most, for the most part, that work was highly classified and its existence that is, the cryptography and the engineering research associates work didn't really come to light until we had equipment, until after the block diagrams, I think, a whirlwind probably had been They invited done. me in 1950 or 51 out there and showed me that. <coughs> what? Because they copied our logic, they said. They slowed it down a little bit because they only had a drum. Speak about it. What role did uh, whirlwind play in cryptography? Well... Nothing. I don't think directly. Uh, they, I was quite surprised they had used the logic of the whirlwind machine and ERA mm -hmm. to build the 1100 or the 1101, except they had changed some of the technology because they didn't have a memory and they needed a huge memory. So they built a drum, a huge drum, and the machine could run it ten times slower and still work with the drum all right. Mm -hmm. and it was easier to build it that way. And so uh, the reason they showed it to me is they said there wasn't it couldn't be classified because they copied it out of our books. <laughs> <laughs> and then reluctantly told me what it was for. Uh, <laughs> I didn't was unaware. Arnold Cohen and Jack Hill, uh, uh, the two I remember. Mm -hmm. and, and well, what's the uses of uh, analog computers uh, brought to bear on cryptology? Uh, Not that I know uh, of. Uh, Digital, probably. I thought Sam Caldwell had gone. <clears throat> down to where no, I guess I, I guess think that would be the, the, uh, those would be digital the encounters. Punch card I think. machines were heavily used. To, yeah. you know, matching of the uh, was an alphabetic uh, pattern match. They so were trying to look for pattern matches yeah. on this code, mm -hmm. and I don't know how you could do it. I suppose d in an analog manner, it would be difficult. I think mm -hmm. because it came over in so many different. Ways. My impression that all of the you know, successes that have come to light have been, uh, that, that occurred in World War II are probably what you call special purpose digital mm -hmm. devices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Then, of course, now it's proliferated into some of the highest speed of general purpose machines. You know, there's another <coughs> longer term aspect of this that I hope Gordon Brown will uh, get into, and that was the educational derivatives of uh, all of this. Uh, Gordon was to have a found effect on engineering education oh, yes. in this country. It grew out of his experience in the several laboratory and working with these people. And that old story of uh, his development of new programs and the uh, electrical engineering series of uh, textbooks yes. and the conferences of engineering educators around the country mm -hmm. that he pulled together. Mm -hmm. uh, and the development of uh, the department itself it mm. makes a very impressive story. And it goes back to, to people like yourself and Hazen and, and Jay and, <coughs> and people in the several lab. Uh, yes, the the several laboratory was one of, uh, I think, MIT's most significant uh, 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 research centers. I agree. A remarkably high percentage of people in it who came out to be leaders in mm -hmm. in various fields, and as you said a while ago, a, uh, a most unusual kind of turbulence, uh, entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. At the time, it seemed terribly mismanaged, but it was managed in such a way, really, that developed people to look after themselves and solve their own problems. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I'd like to see that story told. I'd like to see Gordon have a hand in telling it. I'd like to help too. Mm -hmm. uh, I've often thought as I read uh, the uh, material that's come out on the history of the computer that it's, it's, it's time to get on with the, the real history. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'd like to like, help out on that project. But it's more than just the computer. Uh, the computer. That's all we ask. The computer is. I regard it as the mainstream, going back to the early 30s and even before, but it was surrounded by other streams, right at MIT, that uh, have me speaking of the whole late 20s and early 30s as the birth of the third wave. The birth of the third wave? Yes. That's to borrow Toffler's term. But when you stop to think about the work on servos of Hazen and Brown that really began on the in connection with the computer, the cinema integraph is the, the servo <laughs> uh, that they worked on that led to the paper published in the mid-30s. And uh, that servo and automatic control and fire uh, servos for fire control led to the training program for the Navy that led to the, the servo lab. And then Dra uh, um, Draper's work started in the roughly the mid-30s. And uh, the first course offerings were in that period, and the whole of the instrumentation laboratory was taking shape at that time. Mm -hmm. And it's not generally known, but in the center of analysis, you have not, had not only the punch card installation.